I think this is an important talk, and it's something that I feel very passionate about. You know, I've been a software engineer for, the, for almost two decades, and I've been involved in writing. I, I thought they were getting up because there's no magic. <laughs> they're just moving closer, that's fine. Uh, no, I've been involved in, like, I've been writing code since the, the early 90s, the very late 80s, early 90s, and I've been a professional software engineer for almost two decades. And there are just certain things that I've learned and certain things that I feel passionate about. Now, certainly as a software engineer, I could talk a lot about the technologies that I use, and I would love to do that. But I really feel Lost some audio. But I really feel like if I were to bring something truly unique and, and truly worth your time today, I want to talk a little bit about certain perspectives I've developed over the years, some of the most important lessons I've learned. And among those lessons are a different way at looking at how we use technology to create value, how we use technology to solve problems. So that's really my goal today. Because it starts with this, it starts with this realization that there are problems and there are challenges in our industry. Uh, there's several of them. I talked a little bit about these in my last session, that the way we're taught our craft as software engineers is almost backwards. We're taught in terms of patterns and solutions. And then we go off into the real world and we don't deal with solutions, we deal with problems. And too often we end up with a lot of solutions in search of a problem instead of actually taking the time and spending time in the problem space and thinking about what the problem really is before we start searching for a solution. And we see this with technology as well. We see this with all these open source frameworks that are springing up. They're very quick to tell you, here's our quick start guide, here's our GitHub, jump in, dive in, have fun. And they don't do a very good job of actually articulating the problem that they're trying to solve. What is the problem that this framework was created to solve? And a lot of times, these aren't really doing anything unique, and they're not creating any value at all. And this is why we have so many technological fads. We have all these things. And then there are other things that I've been thinking about as well for a lot of my career. Now, having a career that spans two decades, when I look back, I can think of three. Three truly great software engineers that I've worked with in my career. I've worked with a lot of really great, really, really smart people. I've worked with a lot of good software engineers. But when I really think back, the number three, I keep losing audio. I don't know if we need a new battery pack or what's going on. OK, they're working up. But I'll keep going. And let me ask you this. Uh, somebody who's been 20 or 30 years, who's been practicing software professionally for 20 years? Raise your hand. OK, it's a very young industry. 10 years. All right, in 10 years. How many truly, truly great people have you worked with? I'm sure you've worked with a lot of, again, smart people and good programmers, but truly great. How many would you say? Two people. And behind you, sir, you have about 10 years? Three people. Isn't that incredible? Oh, oh, zero. I thought you were saying three. Zero. Wow. Wherever he works, that's not, we, we need some smart people, so somebody apply there who's great. And that's really amazing. Like, I did this talk a couple days ago, and I talked to somebody who's been working professionally for 37 years, and his number was two. And I thought, that's, that's what I should be talking about. If I could only figure out what it is that makes a software engineer truly great, if I could distill that into a 60-minute talk, we'd have something magic. So I started thinking about this. What does it take? to be a truly great software engineer. And I started going down that path, and I realized there's a more important question. How do we define a great programmer? That's a hard question to answer. I mean, it's not that hard, because really, when you think about it, we're all great, right? Right? We're all at this uh, tippy, tippy top of the bell curve. I mean, at least we felt that way from time to time. I know a lot of people have. I know I have. I know there have been several times in my career when I think to myself, like, I'll take a step back, I'll look at something I just did, and I'll say, you know what? Yeah, I'm starting to get the hang of this. And it's usually within minutes or hours of that thought that everything comes crashing down. You know, just bringing that humility back into my life. But I think everybody thinks they're great software engineers. It's like everybody thinks they're great drivers. And I think anybody who drives in India can attest that that number cannot possibly be accurate. But it's amazing, because great really is a relative thing. And the reason this happens in every industry, in every walk of life, it's this notion of illusory superiority. This is so pervasive. It's actually a frequently studied uh, 
a psychological phenomenon. It, it's kind of like there's also the Dunning-Kruger effect. If you're not familiar with that, it's this notion that the less you know about something, the more likely you are to overestimate your skills. And it actually works both ways, too. The more you know about something, the more likely you are to underestimate your skills. There's a really interesting question I ask in a lot of groups. How many people have to work with bad code on a, on a fairly regular basis? Like I imagine, I'll ask here. Go ahead and raise your hands. You can be honest. We're all friends. A lot of hands, yeah. And usually when I go places, I'll ask the question, almost universally, every hand goes up. One time, I was at a conference. I was uh, with a room full of people. There was only one hand that didn't go up. And I had to ask. I said, so let me ask you this. Uh, did you write all the code? <laughs> or are the people who wrote the code in this room? <laughs> You're never going to believe this response. It was a shrug like this. Because that's always the next question. How many people wrote the code? Now, fortunately, I, know, I don't know about over here, but in the United States, developers tend to hop jobs a lot. And we tend to forget all the spectacular failures we left behind. We tend to forget all the awful legacy code that we leave behind. We'll work somewhere for a couple of years, and then we're going to move on to the next place. And, and we never have to see that. We never have to deal with that. Unfortunately, the reason this is also difficult the definition of great is relative. Like I tell people, it's like the definition of rich is relative. Somebody, a rich person is anybody who earns more than I do. And you can follow that all the way up the stack. I've talked to millionaires who tell me they're just scraping by. They say, oh, you try paying mortgage on 10 properties, a condo, and a yacht. Do you know how much it costs just to crew a yacht without even getting on it? Man, I'm just scraping by. You'd be like, you've got to be kidding me. No, it's the billionaires. No, they're rich. I'm just, I'm just hanging on for dear life. It's crazy. Now, throughout my career, though, in, in all of these uh, explorations, I've learned a lot of things, and most of the things I've learned, I've learned the hard way. In fact, I'm going to share with you today several what I would call problem-solving anti-patterns. Now, we all know that anti-patterns are bad things. But as Neil Ford is fond of saying, well, we already have a word for bad things. That's bad things. We had to create another word for anti-patterns because they're not just bad things. They're bad things that look like good things. Neil Ford will say that an anti-pattern is like a path that looks pleasant lined with flowers. And when you start walking down it, you find out it's a maze filled with monsters. The anti-patterns I have discovered in my career, independently at least, are these. Writing from scratch what already exists, sweating the small stuff, putting my wants ahead of the needs of my team, my organization, over-engineering, rewriting perfectly functional code because it doesn't look pretty enough. The ground-up rewrite, resume-driven development, and the golden hammer. It is these things that I have done in a misguided attempt to be great. And I wasn't creating value. I didn't think about the problems I was solving. I didn't think about the value I was creating. I was thinking about being great. And I think that's really where it fell down. It started in the beginning. I reasoned very reasonably as a, as a young developer, as a budding developer, that a great programmer is anybody who knows more than I do. Right, and it makes sense. If this is the domain of my knowledge, and I know this much, and you know that much, I know I'm good. You must be great. Let's look at it this. My very first programming book was this book right here. Programming Basic on the Apple II. My very first program looked something like this. I remember I showed this to my mother, and she could tell me immediately what it did. And I was a little bit upset because I felt like code should be cryptic. I felt like... It should have been harder for a lay person to understand these things. And it's not to say that my mother wasn't clever or technical, because she was. Actually, my mother is very clever and very good with computers. Uh, in fact, I remember when I was young, I, my ADD was really bad, and I just couldn't sit down and write something. So she would help me out as a very, very young boy. She, I, could, I would tell a story for a first grade or second grade report that I had to write, and she would type it up for me. And I saw that, and I just assumed all adults could type could type 10, you know, touch type, 10 key type, or, uh, yeah, touch type. And I didn't never realize that most people at that time couldn't do that. 
I remember once my mother was doing something else and I had to get my father's help. And my father sat down. I said, would you, if I talked, will you type? And he says, oh, yeah, of course. He types slower than me. I'm standing there talking, and, and I look over, and he's still on the first word. There it is. I don't know why these aren't in alphabetical order. <laughs> no, my dad has his own skills as well, and I don't mean to put anybody down. But uh, I, I, at the time, I didn't realize that, uh, that anybody had these skills. But this was my first program. And I remember my first mind-blown moment. During the 80s, BASIC was a fairly popular programming language, and Byte magazine would always include a BASIC program in every edition. My neighbor gave me a couple back issues of Byte magazine he had in his garage, and I was flicking through and I found the program. And it was the first time I saw something that blew my mind. The program looked something like this. Like I thought I understood BASIC. And then look at this, poke 789, T, poke 784, S, poke 779, D. What the heck is that? Whoever wrote that, I reason, must be some kind of genius that has risen to the highest echelons of the industry, which I was sure was writing programs for a magazine, right? And I thought, well, whoever wrote this must be a genius. I saw that, blew my mind, and that experience directly led me to writing something like this. Now this depending on your perspective, is the worst or the best thing I have ever written. I worked for a company once, 50 SQL developers. This is written in T-SQL, Microsoft SQL. 50 dedicated SQL developers. Not a single person could tell me what it did. I was proud of that. I wore that as a badge of honor. Not only that, I wrote this 11 years ago. In that time, Nobody since has ever been able to tell me what it does. Now, I'm not going to ask you right now for a couple reasons. One, big room, small print. You're at a disadvantage. Two, this is, a, this is not the data day of GIDS, so I don't think there's too many DBAs in the room. And again, unfair advantage. Three, I'll be honest, I don't want to break my record. So, <laughs> no. But this is amazing. And people look at you can kind of you can kind of reason a lot of it out. The name of the function is co encode. It takes the coded string as a parameter, returns encoded string. But what this does is it's a very over-engineered, hyper-efficient database function to URL encode a string for the UI. Right? Because why not? Do it, ship it, put it in production. And nobody ever could tell me what that did. And I thought, I, I thought I'd finally made it to greatness. Nobody I worked with would consider me great. At that time, anybody who worked with me in those years. In fact, all the kind of code that I wrote over these years uh, very uh, eventually became known as Perducci code. And uh, there's a new hire wiki that you have to read. And it says at the beginning, read this. There'll be a test at the end, winky face. And it talks a little bit about Carducci code and their opinions of it, which are not high. And in the test, the question is, how do we feel about Carducci code? Not great. Actively discouraged. Don't do it. All of the above. The answer is all of the above. But when I sent this to Round, all they did, all the, my peers did is fuel the fire, fuel this ego of mine. I sent it to the senior, senior engineer, Rick, and he looked at it, and he wrote it back. He says, this is beautiful. What does it do? And I explained, and he wrote me back, and he says, and I quote, I am not smart enough to have come up with what you have here. And I say that in all earnestness. I know that that's the quote because... I've, I printed that email out. I, I believe it's framed somewhere. And I used to quote it in cover letters for jobs. It just, but like this just stuck with me. Because I was thinking, if a smart programmer is somebody who knows more than I do, then I must be smart if I know more than my peers. But it doesn't matter how clever it is if other people can't maintain it. And in the end, I fell prey to several problem-solving anti-patterns. I wasn't creating value. In a lot of ways, I was creating a net negative value. I was writing from scratch what already exists. Let me ask you this. Is there anybody here has a real-world use case for actually rolling their own URL encode? Of course not. 
Nobody in this millennia will ever have to do that. But I rolled my own, not only that, in the database tier, right, just because. It was also super efficient. Like, I wrote that like I was going to be URL encoding two gigabyte strings. At that time, in SQL Server, for a Unicode string, there was a 4,000 character max. So it's not like I was ever going to get anywhere beyond that. It's not like writing a loop versus that weird stuff that I did was really going to matter. But I did it anyway. And I completely misunderstood what I was trying to do, what I was supposed to do as a software engineer to deliver value. That wasn't it. Uh, Neil Ford is also fond of saying that the developers are drawn to complexity like moths to a flame, frequently with the same result. And you can keep going. There's so many different ways to look at this, so many different metrics I've come up with over the years. Like some people think, and I still see this today, that real developers crank out lots of code. Like they sit down with an empty terminal and they jam out a ton of code. At the end of the day, they've written you know, 50 classes and everything else. And that's what you have to do to be a great developer. And there's a lot of different reasons that people come to this. One of, them, one of the things is, though, this is not a very useful metric. You know, Bill Gates once said that measuring software progress by lines of code written is like measuring progress on building an airplane by its weight. Right? It's a horrible metric, but we still get this. You know, I don't know anybody who actually still gets paid by the thousand lines of code anymore. And I, I joked about this once. I, told, I was in a talk once, and I mentioned this. I said, I don't know anybody who gets paid by the thousand lines of code before, anymore, because that was actually a metric at one point. In the 70s and the 80s, a lot of contracts were negotiated by the, the, the thousand lines of code, the K-lock. And I just mentioned this. I said this as an offhand comment, and I had one little, like, sheepish hand go up in the back. And I remember I made a joke, and it was a horrible joke. It was a dumb joke. I said, what is it, some kind of government contract? Ha -ha. And I said that because, you know, it does, I'm not a political person, or at least I'm not publicly very political. And in fact, whatever you think my political leanings are, you're probably wrong. Um, and, I, and I don't really go political, but it doesn't really matter. That's like a universal thing. Because in the United States, every administration in my lifetime has had some kind of waste, financial waste scandal. You know, you don't live in a country in $30 trillion in debt without being, there's a little bit of wasteful spending somewhere. And it doesn't matter who you are, left or right, it's, it, it always happens. So it was like one of those softball, you know, underhand pitch, easy jokes. And I said that. And the person said, you do know where you are, right? I was in the Washington, D.C. area. As it happened, everybody in the room was working on government contracts. This is why I don't make jokes, by the way. They don't get any funnier. But the thing is, it's a horrible metric. We're not really building a wall. And I think there's a couple reasons that, that this becomes some kind of metric that, that, that we try to live up to. You know, one is these warped portrayals of hackers in TV and the movies. We've all seen these, right? Where they do this ridiculous thing. They've got, they, they zoom in on an image until it's just seven pixels. And they say, can you enhance that? Click, 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 click. And then all of a sudden, these millions of pixels come out of nowhere. They just get built into, uh, into the real world. I used to work for somebody who thought that's how things really worked. He'd be, some manager, he'd be building a PowerPoint presentation, and he'd go find a, like a 20 by 20 pixel thumbnail, and then he would stretch it out to fill the PowerPoint. And it's just, I mean, it's just big blocks. There's nothing there. And he would send it to me with the, with the caption on the email. He's like, hey, can you enhance this, please? So, I, you know, I just find, I zoom it back down. Okay, that's a logo, and then I do a search on the internet for that logo and I find a higher res when I put it in there. He's like, oh, thanks. And I never said that I was doing that. And it was always a funny thing when I finally left that country, uh, company. He said to somebody else, can you enhance this? And he said, you know that's not possible, right? He said, well, Michael could do it. Well, he's magic. And it's just one of those memes that kind of stuck around. And, but the other metric, you know, when they have the hackers on TV, in fact, you know, I'll just take a brief digression. Have you ever seen Hacker Typer? I'll show you this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm to, gonna, oh, maybe not. No, not without internet, I don't think. Do I have internet? I do. Yeah, here we go. Is that going here? You got to go full screen for this. It's the best takeaway of the conference, I promise. Hacker typer, ready? I'm 
Hacking. Oh no, access denied. Keep hacking. Hack harder. Hack faster. Hooray! I used to keep that on a tab at work because I had one of those bosses that liked to walk the halls and, uh, and just see what people are doing at any given time. And I had one of those little mirrors on my screen. So I could always see when he was walking around the corner. And whenever he did, I would just do a swipe to a different space where that was there. And I'd just be like, pretend I didn't see him. And all those texts would be flying across the screen. I'd watch him walk by with his coffee cup. And he'd stand behind me for a minute and do this. <laughs> and he walked to the next person who didn't buy that mirror. It's like nine bucks. It's a really good inv investment. And he'd be on Twitter or something. He'd be like... But, uh, like I said, I don't know anybody's, yeah, 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 we're there, we're not building a wall. But there's other things as well, because this is just a warped measure of productivity. I'm going to take a little break and tell you about my, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my first job as a software engineer. It wasn't, it, it wasn't officially my first job, but unofficially it was my first job. When I started my career, if you were my last talk, you remember I told you I was the house magician at TGI Fridays. I don't know what the Indian equivalent is, but it's basically kind of a mid-range family restaurant and stuff. It's kind of a goofy place to work. And uh, I was the house magician, which I thought was a really big accomplishment, except house magician at TGI Fridays doesn't make very much money. And not only that, I worked a couple hours on Friday and a couple hours on Saturday. That was it. And that was not enough to get me to the lifestyle to which I'd like to become accustomed. So I started walking down the street one day, and I saw a temp agency. Big sign in the window. I lived in England at the time. Big sign in the window. It says, earn six pounds an hour, which, as it turns out, is 50% more than the house magician at TGI Fridays makes. So I'm like, okay, I want to earn 50 pounds, six, or sorry, six pounds an hour. So I walked in. I swung the door open. I don't know what I was thinking. I swung the door open, and I said, I'd like to earn six pounds an hour. And the woman just looked at me for a minute, and she kind of choked on a laugh. And then she realized, you know what, it's 4.30. I'm going home in half an hour. i got nothing else to do. There's nobody else here. She's like, whatever, I'll, uh, let, me, let me see what you can do. And I remember I walked in. First question was, can she, can she said, can you type? This was the 90s, right? It wasn't a, a universal skill like it kind of is now. She says, can you type? And I said, oh, yeah. And she says, no, with, uh, with 10 fingers. I'm like, well, nine, but yeah. And as you can tell, she's thrown by this. She looked at my hand. She wanted to see if I was, like, missing a finger. I'm like, well, I don't use this one very often. And, and so I, I'm like, yeah. And she's like, well, okay, let me see for real. And she put me in front of the typing test. Turns out, at the time, uh, 18 years old, I could type 85 words a minute. No mistakes, 100% accuracy. She's a little bit impressed. She said, where did you learn how to type? Did you take a typing class in school? And I said, who takes a typing class in school? She said, where did you learn? I said, IRC. She, what? Nothing. Never mind. And uh, then she gives me another test to do. She says, have you used any of the Office applications? I'm like, I think I used Excel once in school. And I used P Word. I've used Word. And she's like, what about Outlook? What about, you know, a couple other things? I'm like, uh, no, no, I haven't. And she puts me in front of the test anyway. Turns out I score 100% across the board. And it, it's not hard. It turns out if you need to format something, it might be in the format menu, just a lucky guess. And I just did that. You just like think through everything, and it's not that difficult. It's not timed. And uh, think for a minute, and oh, yeah, right there. And it, so she was really impressed. She starts getting excited. Now she's changed her perception of me. Because you've got to remember, I walked in goofy-like, and the way I was dressed really kind of made her think twice about me. I was wearing flip-flops, cut-off shorts, and a tie-dye shirt that I made myself. And she was just like, who is this guy? And she's starting to get excited. She says, oh, you know, I, I, I think I can get you a placement. I, th I, th I think there's an opportunity here for you. Here, sit down. Let's take some information. And she's typing up my information, my phone number, my national insurance number, my address, all these usual details. And at one point, she turns the screen around so I can check everything she typed in. It turns out I can read a lot faster than she thought I could. Because as I'm reading through the page, I got through the address, everything. I verified all the phone numbers, all that. And I got to the bottom of the screen. Under candidate notes, it said this. Typical American guy. <laughs> Thinks he's funny. Yeah, that left a mark. What, I think my face changed when I read that. Like, oh. And so she f turns the screen back around really quick. That might have been why I got the job. She just felt bad. But either way, I got a job as a, as a, as a temp, just doing usual office temp stuff. I was formatting spreadsheets. And I realized really quickly that... Uh, 
I could write programs that do my job and the same amount of time it would take me to just do my job. So that's what I did. I, started, I, was, I was working in Excel one day, and somehow I hit Alt F11, and the Visual Basic editor popped up. I was like, I know Visual Basic. I spent my entire career at school writing little prank programs in Visual Basic, like one that would display fake error messages, one that would uh, log people's passwords when they try to log in, all kinds of goofy little things like that. And so I automated my entire workflow. And uh, it got to a point, after about six weeks, it got to a point that I could do my entire week's work in 15 minutes. It was the best job I ever had, because nobody knew. <laughs> my boss calls me into her office one day, and she says, Michael, can you come in here? I said, sure. She says, um, would you mind shutting the door? I should have been worried at that point, but I was young and naive. So I shut the door, I sat down, I said, what's up? And she said, when you were in school, did you, did you study theater? Did you take a theater class? I said, of course. What, how, do you, how can you tell? She said, oh, just a hunch. She said, when you were doing theater, did you do any voice coaching? No, not really. What about singing lessons? Did you ever take any singing lessons? And I said, no. Why do you ask? She said, well, it's your voice. It's got this quality. It carries. Because I'm sitting here in my office trying to work, and all I hear is yap, 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 yap all day long. <laughs> I'm like deer in the headlights, shaking. And she says, what have you even gotten done today? Quite a bit, it turns out. And I, I was like, oh, OK, oh, I got this. I, and I, I, didn't, I didn't know I'd lost track of what was due on any particular day, because it was all done. And so I asked her, I said, well, what, what should I have accomplished? And oh, that just incensed her further. And she says, well, you better have these date reports. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's done. Show me. And I sent it to her. And she's got it. She's like, oh, OK. Well, you better have this. You better have that. And she kept looking for things to find to get me in trouble over. She ran out of work this week. She was on stuff that was due next week. And she couldn't find anything. She wanted to be mad at me. But she couldn't. And, you know, I actually enjoyed that gig for quite a while. Eventually, uh, something happened, a big incident with a particular customer. And we were being audited. We need five years of reports yesterday, like literally yesterday. And she didn't want to ask me. She asked everybody else in the company for help before me. But they still weren't going to be able to get all those reports put together in like less than a week. So she got approval for overtime for me. She sat down, started being nice to me. Michael, um, can, you work, can you work late tonight, and can you work this weekend? She told me the whole situation. Basically, we were being audited, and if we couldn't make that customer happy, they were gonna, we were going to lose that customer. And her job was tied to that contract. So if that contract goes away, she gets fired. Very, very high stakes. And I decided, OK, you know what? No more goofing off. I'm going to save the day. And I'm going I'm to level with what I've got here. So I go away. Few clicks, few minutes. I've got all five years of reports broken in the folders, broken down by month, all the different reports, nicely formatted everything, and ready to go. I zipped it, emailed it to her, and I walked into her office to see if she'd gotten it. And she had gotten it. And I know this because she was completely dumbfounded. She was staring at the screen, completely speechless. Which kills me, by the way, as a magician, that that was the first and only time I've ever made somebody truly speechless. I walk in, she's got one hand on the mouse, her mouth is hanging open, and she's just, like, just sounds are dripping out. She's like, what? Where, 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 the, how, where? The, and just can't get words together. Finally, like, one single word escapes her lips. She looks at me and she says, how? And I'm not going to lie, I, I was overcome with temptation, right? It, it happened. I'm not, I'm, I'm not proud of this, but this was my response. Magic! <laughs> and like that snapped her out of it. She says, no, seriously, where did you get this? I'm like, a good magician never reveals a secret. She says, you're not a good magician. Where did you get this? And I have to show her everything. And I, and, and I have all these tools now. And again, she wanted to be mad at me, but she couldn't. And it was at that moment that my job changed entirely. And, and that fun goofing off period was over because I kind of got promoted to be office systems developer. And I was still 
on the same office temp pay, and I think that's kind of fair. I'm not, I'm not upset about that. But it meant that there were real requirements from me. But she was not a technical person. She didn't know how to measure program or productivity, and she was already a little suspicious of me. So I would, you know, I remember one day I was talking to somebody. I was taking a little break, and she says, Michael, get in here. I go, okay. And I walk in, and she says, show me what you've done today. And I was actually really proud of this because I just hit a major milestone. It turns out at the time, I was, there was a, the library that I was using, there was a bug in it. And this was back in the day that we didn't have Stack Overflow. So we couldn't just say, why am I getting this error? And somebody says, well, there's a bug in it. Here's the worker. And you're like, oh, thanks. That took me two minutes. No, we had to figure that stuff out. And so I go through this. I'm like, I'm really proud of myself. And I print out the module. It fills up half a page. And that's with the line wrapping. And I show it to her. I'm like, this is what I got working today. And I was so proud of myself. And she looked at it. And she said, this, this is it. I could have typed that in five minutes. <laughs> and that was her metric. How many lines of code that I typed. And there's so many bosses still work like this because they don't really know how to measure our productivity because they might come from some other managerial background or from whatever education they've got you know when they're manufacturing something you can count units produced but when you're a knowledge worker when you're writing code you can't measure it at all like that but people try to anyway and this is really where this comes from and uh, you know we have to educate people to turn that around but I'm going to move on a little bit. I'm going to share a couple other little stories. And I'm mostly going to throw myself under the bus. I think that's fair. Uh, because in this pursuit of greatness, again, not in the pursuit of value, the pursuit of greatness, I realized that maybe it's just quality of code, right? Good programmers write good code. Bad programmers write bad code. Uh, I started my career quite a while. In the early days, I'm going to be honest, I was a Visual Basic developer. Not even VisualBasic.net, just plain old VB. And I feel OK telling you this, because there's a lot of really great developers in this room that would never and have never touched Visual Basic. But I feel OK sharing this with you, because I know that we're all friends here. And not only that, right? we've all done things we're not proud of to pay the bills when we're young, and this was me. I remember I joined this company. And the pursuit of greatness, I decided I was going to fix their code. First day of the job, they say, Familiarize yourself with the code base. So I familiarize myself with it. And I immediately start shaking my head. I immediately start clicking my tongue at this code quality. Because there's all kinds of things wrong with it. I know small print, big room, so I'm going to point out some of the highlights for you. This is just like one of the things that I found. Hungarian notation? Stir table? We don't need to prefix anything with stir anymore. Hungarian notation, in my opinion, was one of the three worst things that ever came out of Microsoft. And then I'm looking at this. We're modifying a by ref parameter. And if you're not familiar with Visual Basic, basically the parlance in Visual Basic is you pass a string to a function, it gets passed by ref or by reference. So it's not the string itself getting moved over there. It's a reference to the string in the calling function. So when we modify it here, it's going to modify in the calling function. And you don't really want to do that. It's a bad practice, and it's the kind of thing that's going to have unintended consequences. It's like a rookie mistake. And I'm like, geez, where, who, where are these people from? And then select star from. What are we, animals? And where's the white space? I mean, this is a mess. And I decided I was going to do them all a favor. I was going to show these old timers how it was done. I was going to show everybody what a great programmer I really was. So I took all that code, and I turned it from bad code to oh, good code. Again, big room, small print. You probably can't read it in the very, very back, but it doesn't matter. If you just squint and look at this, you can see how beautiful it is. Like, this is good code. You know, I got camel casing for the variable names, Pascal casing for the function names. I got rid of it. I don't have to do, I don't have to pass that by val. I don't have to declare it as by val because I'm not modifying the parameter because I read the manual and I know ADODB allows you to pass a command type of AD command table and then I don't have to give it a query. I can just give it a table. I mean, come on, read the manual, people, and all this. This is so much better. And so I tested it. I mean, I compiled it, right? Right? Checked it in. Patted myself on the back. I think I had two beers that night in celebration. And I was sure I did a great thing. I was sure that proves I'm a great programmer. Remember I said that every time I looked at something and said, you know, I'm really great, everything came crashing down? That is exactly what happened. We deployed this software to 61 schools across the UK, which meant... Driving to 61 schools over a period of multiple days, walking around with a floppy disk, and, drive, and installing this on every single computer. It's a long and tedious process. 
I didn't realize that whole by ref thing, they knew about it. This little line right here is stripping the select star from, from the variable that got modified in the previous line of code. Now, instra returns a minus one if it doesn't find the string. And minus one is not a valid index for the mid function. This will throw an exception. And notice the, the, the complete lack of exception handling, error handling. Not even the, what might be the single greatest and worst feature of Visual Basic, the on error resume next declaration, which basically means, hey, if something happens, don't worry about it, just keep going. That's like a real thing in Visual Basic. That's how great this language really was. And uh, nobody really tested this particular function. Everybody just kind of agreed that uh, we just don't touch it because it's a really difficult thing for us to test. And we deployed it, and I won't ever forget this day. I'm sitting in my office, sitting at my desk. The phone rings. And I have to answer. It's a small company. Like, I don't, I'm a developer. I don't want to answer the phone and talk to people. But whatever, I answered it. And I had to apologize because it rang three times. That was a script, and I resented that even more. But whatever, I answered the phone, and I, they gave me the error number. Not the whole message, just the number, because, right, I'm an engineer. I should just know what 800E527362 means. And the only time that I ever actually know what the error number means is when it's something I wrote, and they say, yeah, I'm getting an error ID 10T. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay, here's how you fix it. Shut off the computer, walk away, leave the room. <laughs> but uh, no, they, they, they give me the error number, and then I, I'm taken down, I create a bug ticket, and I'm like, I'm so sorry, uh, I'll, give you, I'll call you back as soon as we have an update, and I go to hang up the phone. And when I hang up the phone, I see something I've never seen before. 20 red LEDs lit up on the phone. Turns out we had 20 lines. I had no idea. I answered the second line, same error. Third line, same error. I assume the fourth line was the same error as well. I don't know. I was hiding in the bathroom. And that's where I was for the rest of the day. But we eventually got it cleaned up. We patched it. And the next day, my boss sits me down smiles and what the hell were you thinking <laughs> and I try to explain that I'm I was it was better code it was better quality and I was cleaning it up and I was fixing it. and I didn't know how to articulate this so I was talking and all that came out was this I said I, 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 I fixed it <laughs> and he smiles at me shakes his head and says no no you see I think what we have here is one of our anglo-american differences See, you Yanks invent a game, you play with your hands, and you call it football. Where we invented a game, we play with our feet. We call that football. I think it's one of these. See, using the Queen's English, when you fix something, you transform it from a non-functional state into a functional state. Now, I think you'll find that it was in a functional state and then you intervened, and it's now in a non-functional state. That would be, right, the, raw, the opposite of fixed. That would be, that's right, you broke it. And I'm like, no, no, I, I, I fixed it. He says, no, no, Michael, let, oh, let me step back. And we just went through. We kept going through in these loops. And, and finally, he has this mic drop moment where he says, I pushed the button, darn it. There we go. Finally, he has this mic drop moment when he says, well, look, I like the way my broken code works better than the way that your fixed code doesn't. Slam. That was the end of the conversation. I don't actually know how they didn't fire me, but I doubled down in my pursuit of greatness, and I decided that it wasn't the cleanest code, it was the fastest code, because that's something you can measure. If you write a function and I write a function and mine is slightly faster, it must be better. Right? If they do the same thing, it's got to be the same. Turns out not all optimizations are good optimizations. This is a famous one. This rather innocuous looking if endf that's nestled in within hundreds and hundreds of other if endfs is justifying why they're rolling their own memory management in a rather widely used SSL implementation. This was Heartbleed. They made it faster, but they didn't make it better. And when you're in this situation, when you're in danger of over-engineering or when you're in danger of premature optimization or anything like that, you've really got to step back. You've really got to be objective. Like, if we think about it, if we ask this, 
Is Malik really your biggest bottleneck? Really? Yeah, the funny thing about that, so the maintainers of LibC thought this whole buffer overread, buffer overrun problem was kind of a problem, right? It was kind of a, kind of a big problem. And they decided to put in exploit countermeasures in the LibC. And uh, essentially, if you tried to overread or overwrite, it would just crash. And then you'd say, oh, my app crashed. You'd look at the stack dump. You'd be like, oh, whoops, put some boundary checks in there. And then it fixed it. And eventually, after a couple of years, all the buffer overreads, overwrites would go away. And the maintainers of OpenSSL decided they were going to put in exploit countermeasure countermeasures and bypass all of that and roll their own memory management. You know, but unfortunately, I didn't have this to learn from. I learned this mistake my own way. I was actually guilty of extreme optimization. Now, I, if you, I mentioned my last talk, I do skydive a lot. That's not me. It's really hard to find somebody who will let me borrow their laptop. And it's actually really hard to find an old, cheap laptop. But I need this. I want a real laptop. I want a laptop that I can actually code on when I do this to get this picture because I actually want to write a program on the way down. I want to write a program on the way down and uh, for a couple of reasons. One, just bragging rights. Right? I want to tell people, you know, may, I fall pretty fast. I fall 150, 160 miles an hour. Maybe I can claim the title of world's fastest programmer. But the other reason, the jokes. I'll be, uh, I want to land, you know, deploy, write my code really, because you've got 45 seconds of useful free fall time. I want to write my program real quick, F5, see if it runs, just in time, wave off, deploy my parachute, try to hold on, but the G-forces of a deploying parachute are kind of high, so I'm probably going to drop the laptop and be like, well, I'm glad it's over a field, and uh, I'm going to land my parachute on the ground. All my developer friends are going to be there like, so, so, did it run? Did it work? Crashed. And the jokes write themselves, too. I mean, there's so many. Are you going to try again? Well, I better defragment my hard drive first. What program did you write? <whistles> Hello, world. <laughs> but I, I worked for this company. I decided that I was going to, they, they gave me one of those go away, kid, you bother me projects. Something that I couldn't possibly screw up. Nothing is foolproof to a sufficiently talented fool. But they gave me this really well-defined, really well-bounded project. They needed me to make some. And if you've never used written any Visual Basic, you probably don't know, but you could, I assume you, you could probably guess that Visual, Visual Basic is not a particularly high performance language. And their string manipulation is not particularly high performance. And I ended up rolling my own string management. I started storing strings, bypassing all the Visual Basic stuff, just storing my strings as a by, array of bytes in memory. And then I was manipulating those, because that's all this, really, this processing really was, is manipulating big strings and, and building a bunch of other stuff. And uh, so they were all, I just stored it as an array of bytes in memory, and I was calling low-level system APIs to just move bytes of memory around. I'd give it an address, move it from here to here, move it from here to here. And at one point, I realized that I don't actually have to, I don't have to write this in Visual Basic. All I'm doing is I'm just moving memory around. I could do this in assembly language. I think that would be faster. So, I, you know, they say you can't write inline, inline assembly code in a Visual Basic app. Lazy people say that. It turns out, given enough time, you can figure out how to trick the compiler into letting you do anything. And I, uh, I figured out how to compile my Visual Basic to assembly. I figured out how to build a, write a stub. And I would look at the compiler decoration the compiler put on it. And I would write a module in W32 ASM. And I'd swap them out halfway through the compilation. And then compile it, link it, ship it. And it was actually really fast. They were impressed. And then I did what anybody would do when they write a ton of assembly code in a Visual Basic shop. I quit my job and left the country. Somebody else's problem. And I, I was in America. I moved back to America. I was living there for about six weeks, and my phone rang. My brand new American cell phone. And it was an English phone number. And I, I was like, who knows this number? And I answered it. And it was my old boss. Michael, he said. It's Tim. I said, hey, well, hey, Tim, uh, what's up? He says, uh, that import routine, where is it? Because he looked in the source control, in the, in the app, in, in the uh, solution, and it was just an empty module with an empty function. Everything was stubbed out because you swapped that out with your assembly module. And I tried to explain it's not there. You've got to look in the file system. He couldn't find it. I said go into source control. He couldn't find it. Turns out they migrated from one source control system to another in the intervening time. And um, 
There's two different ways to do that. There's the right way and the way they did it, where they basically just check everything into the new one. And who needs that history anyway, right? And uh, when they did that, they cleaned up a bunch of stuff that had been getting checked in in the past. People had been checking in, you know, debug symbols and compiler artifacts and all kinds of garbage that had no business being in there. And they, uh, they cleaned it all up, and they mine got swept up in the net because it didn't look like anything that, any, that it was anything important. So I started trying to explain how to recreate it, or I started trying to explain that he should get it from the backup. It turns out that company backups were more of like an idea. Because the, uh, the boss's attitude at the time was, look, we've got six developers. Everybody's got a laptop. They take it home at night. Plus, we've got the server. What are the odds that every single developer's house is going to get broken into and the office is going to burn down in one single day? Who needs a backup? They do, it turns out. But it doesn't matter. I started trying to explain how to recreate it. And he, he stopped me. He says, no, no, no. Here's an idea. You'll do it. And I just moved, made an international move. I moved halfway around the world. So I'm thinking, you know what? I could use a little bit of freelance, uh, freelance work. So we negotiated. I used all the tricks that I knew. And I negotiated them up to a rate of free and to a schedule of now. And I started working on it. And I, and I missed something. You know, this was in the pursuit of greatness. But there was nothing great about that. Maybe a clever developer, maybe a good developer knows how to make low-level optimizations like that. But a great software engineer knows when to leave that alone. And if I'm objective about my motives for a minute, I didn't do it because I thought it was the best thing for the customer or the best thing for the company or even the best thing for my team. I did it because I wanted to show off. I wanted to, I wanted to show everybody that I could use a real programming language. And I didn't realize that if I would have just given, handed in my optimized VB6, I would have delivered significantly more value. But I put my wants ahead of the needs of my team they need, I need to give them something they can maintain, and the organization. They need to have something they even can build. That had such a convoluted build process, nobody could even build it. And, you know, I thought maybe a great programmer uses real languages. And, and you run into this, you know. I, I, I realize now that, uh, you know, it's hard for me to let go of assembly language. Because learning assembly language for me was like a real rite of passage, like I was doing real programming at this point. And... It's hard to let go of that. And we all have different aspects of it. We all have different things. It's hard to let go of the things that just don't matter anymore. You know, because everything is changing so much, so much quicker, so much quicker, that we start working at higher and higher levels of abstraction. You know, I was sitting in Scott Davis's talk earlier today, and he was talking about how to build these conversational UIs and how speech recognition is a difficult problem. But it's not the problem that we have to solve. Writing a JavaScript engine is a difficult problem, but it's not the problem that we have to solve. You know, we have V8, it's a great JavaScript engine, and people are building on top of that. You know, the people who wrote no didn't write their own JavaScript engine. The people, you know, they, they, they're, they're leveraging the best tools. And as we go through our careers, we start working at higher and higher levels of abstraction, and we have to let go of some of that low-level stuff. And that hurts, it's hard to do. And when you do that long enough, you start to develop a complex about it. You start to feel like you're a fraud, right? That... All the real programmers are doing this low-level stuff, and here I am just assembling plugins and modules and, and building boring business apps. I'm not a real developer. Imposter syndrome is a real thing, and it affects a lot of people in our industry. And a lot of people go the other way. They can't let go of that high level of abstraction. They feel like they have to roll their own everything. And we get asked, you know, and, and when we do inter interviews, we get asked these questions that have no basis, no bearing in reality. You know, questions like how, you know, interview questions. You walk into an interview room and they say, write a quick sort function to sort an array of n integers. Nobody's ever going to have to do that in the real life. I walked into a job interview once and I wrote arrays.sort and they got mad at me. I mean, there are valid and, and, and genuinely useful whiteboard questions. I don't think that's one of them. I think that question is almost but not quite entirely useless. John Evans wrote a really interesting article a few years ago called Why the New Guy Can't Code. And he says this. He says, I can guarantee you without fear of contradiction that no programmer will ever have to write a binary search after being hired. It's like choosing a contractor because they know how to forge and cast steel using coal, iron, an oven, and a bellows when all they really need to know is A, the address of the nearest Home Depot, and B, what to do with the steel once they buy it. 
And I talk to people about this. I think this is one of the most important lessons I've learned in my career, this ability to let go of these things. And when I need to move on to a higher level of abstraction and work on harder problems than the problems I was working on a couple of years ago, then it's OK to let go of these things. And I talk to people, and they push back. They say, they say I don't want to be limited by my tools. And I get that. Like, I'm not against the whiteboard per se, but I'd rather use the whiteboard to learn more about a candidate. I, I'm a fan of having candidates write code. Language fluency has value, but memorizing algorithms in most cases doesn't. Just like, you're, just like I'm never really going to have to write a URL encode function, I'm never really going to have to write a quick sort function. I would almost bet, I would bet most of my life savings on that. Not all of it, because you never know. Some weird situation might happen. You know, maybe there's an apocalyptic event, and I'm the only person left that can program, and all the libraries are good. That might happen. You never know. Uh, but it does demonstrate how clever you are. And I get it. You know, it's hard to be more proud of, of building something versus just using something. But if I were to sum up this entire talk, this is writing code, and this is solving problems. And I talk about this, and, and, I, and I say, no, you know, nobody would arbitrarily write code that already exists. And it turns out they would. I remember I worked for a company, and uh, we had a very weird bug. A very weird bug. And it was just, you know, I, I tried to, to reproduce it. I couldn't do it. You know, I, every time the bug report would come in, tap, 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 cannot reproduce, closed. Who wants to go to lunch? And I tried. I, mean, I genuinely tried. But it turns out at one point, it was disproportionately affecting one customer. And uh, they got so upset that they ended up waking the president of the company up in the middle of the night to scream at him. Who, he didn't like getting screamed at. And he scheduled an emergency all-hands engineer meeting at 7.30 AM. Now, if you were to create a Venn diagram, he sent that email, by the way, at about 11.45 at night. And if you were to create a Venn diagram of employees at that company who naturally came into the office at 7.30 AM, and employees who, nat who usually check email at midnight, I'd be somewhere over there. I came in late that day. And my trick when I would come in late to the office is I would buy breakfast. I'd buy donuts or bagels or breakfast tacos or kolaches or something. And uh, I rolled into the office that day. I remember it was about 10, 30-ish. And I literally walked into this. It was all going down, and uh, it took us several hours to, to really start piecing together what was going on. And I remember we were pair, pair debugging. I was step, 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 step. Huh. That's weird. My, my, my colleagues started freaking out. And I, was, you know, I, I didn't think we'd found the problem yet. And he thought we did. He was right, it turns out. Uh, I didn't think we found the problem, because the only way that could be the problem was if we were getting hash collisions. And there's no way we're getting hash collisions, right? That's, that's, just, that, that's not rooted in reality. And I go to prove it to him, and huh, sure enough, we're getting hash collisions. And he starts freaking out. I start getting excited, right? We're going to be famous. This is a big deal. We just broke a major hashing algorithm. This is like a, a perfect storm. This is, uh, you know, this is a 100-year flood. I'm going to write a white paper. I'm going to get to speak at conferences in India. This is a big deal. Until I realized that the dude rolled his own hashing algorithm, which was smart, or was cool, but it wasn't smart. And he ran into some of these problem-solving anti-patterns as well, sweating the small stuff. And you, you, see, this, you see this a lot. You know, there, there are so many of these that can sneak up on you. And we could keep going. You know, we can keep going all these different definitions of uh, uh, what a good programmer is and, and everything else. Uh, all told, all the, all the anti-patterns that I've found in my career, there are several of these. But let's look at the other side of this in closing. Because if we really want to be great, we've got to stop pursuing greatness in the quality of code, and we start trying to improve the value that we create as engineers, and, and different skills that we can create for this, uh, you know, empathy is hugely important. Being able to understand all these different viewpoints, being able to, to slow down sometimes, think slowly and carefully, studying other solutions, and, 
that requires some degree of humility to be able to, to understand that we don't know all the answers and being okay with that. Because sometimes there's so much pressure on us to be right and to be senior and all these things. And just being able to let go, being able to let yourself be vulnerable in those situations, broadening knowledge, just genuinely being curious. Because every single thing we learn in our lifetime will create a platform for everything else that we're going to learn. That, that, that we don't learn in absolutes. I had a big conversation, I recorded this, it's on a podcast with Venkat. And, and Venkat was talking about how we don't learn in absolutes in big chunks, we learn in deltas. You know, we, we learn something right on top of something, that we, the last thing we learned. And every single thing we learn, whatever it is, creates a platform for the next thing we learn. And sometimes we learn something in a field completely 180 degrees from, from our primary field, and it makes us better as programmers. I've discovered this. So many skills I developed, not as a software engineer, but as a performer, made me a better software engineer, made me a better leader, made me a better communicator, made me a better problem solver, and these things are huge. I talk a lot about empathy, and I, and I think empathy is maybe one of the most important skills that we can cultivate, being able to look at things from other people's perspective. So if we're going to stop solving, writing code and start solving problems, the first thing we have to do is approach everything from the perspective of value. Great programmers consistently bring value to the team and to the organization. And this skill will transcend anything you will learn in your career as a software engineer. Because languages, frameworks, everything else, you know they're going to come and go. But if you can create value, then you can always do this in any environment, in any situation. Matt Stein, one of the speakers on the No Fluff Tour, says, if you are able to create business value, you will be in demand. And if you're solving the problems of the business and the community, you're creating value. I'm a huge proponent of Agile methodologies because value and understanding drive all the effort. What is going to deliver the most value? How can we create the most value in this period of time? And, we, and, val and understanding drives the effort as well. We don't talk about functions, features in terms of check marks that we do this function, we do this function, we do this function. We try, we make the effort to understand what the value is we're creating for the customer. You know, and some of these things are important. You know, some, being able to minimize the amount of work we do, maximizing the amount of work not done. Uh, Jamie Zawinski basically said this, at the end of the day, we just ship the thing. It's great to rewrite your code and make it cleaner, and by the third time, it'll actually be pretty. But that's not the point. You're not here to write code. You're here to ship products. You're here to deliver value to the customers. And uh, Jamie Zawinski popularized Richard Gase, Gabriel's precept of uh, worse is better, that a 50% good solution that is actually in the wild, in people's hands, will create more value and solve more problems than a 99% good solution that nobody has because it's still in your lab and you're endlessly polishing the thing. And this is a hard thing. Like, I have stood up in front of rooms like this for several months talking about this quote and talking about how something that's 50% good in the wild is better than something 99% good that nobody has. And I was doing that. I had a product that I wouldn't release. I'm like, it's got to be perfect. It's got to be perfect. It's got to be perfect. No, we've just got to recognize good enough. You know, our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. And I talked a little about over-engineering. I talked a lot about over-engineering, in fact. And one of the most important questions you can ask yourself in these situations when you're in danger of over-engineering is quite simply this. Does the user care? If I do this really complicated thing instead of this really simple thing, is it going to improve the customer's experience? Am I going to deliver more value by doing this? Or am I just going to do something clever that I'm going to be proud of in the pursuit of greatness instead of the pursuit of value? And, and that's the hardest thing. You know, this is why understanding the customer, having that empathy is so important. Because when, when you can deliver functions without delivering value. And this is where, this is why I think it's so bizarre that so many developers write software without ever interacting with the customer. I think one of my biggest competitive advantages I have in my industry, in my market, in my company, is that I talk to my customers every single day. And I know what they need, and I know how to deliver incremental value instead of just delivering incremental features that deliver zero value until they're all delivered. So in closing, our problem-solving, we have our problem-solving anti-patterns, but let's talk about our problem-solving hallmarks. Leveraging existing resources to increase your output. Pick your battles. Not everything is life and death. Focus on the work that will deliver the most business value, the most value to your customer over the most interesting work. Neil Ford says this a lot. He says, meta work is more interesting than real work. 
deliver just enough, just in time, be able to recognize good enough, act as a thought leader in your organization, be the person that other people emulate, use the right tool for the job and look at problems from the perspective of the business and the customer because ultimately that's where your paycheck comes from. Now in closing, if you, if you find this talk thought-provoking, if you find some of these ideas interesting, I have a collection of essays here in the slides and I think these are available through, through, uh, through the, the website. Uh, basically, there's a couple here, stilldrinking.org slash programming sucks, wonderful essay, the big redesign in the sky, why the new guy can't code, and the duct tape programmer. These are not absolutes that everything should or should not be, because like Scott was saying in the keynote, it's not, it, it, it's not a, a yes, no, this way or that way distinction. There's a lot of gray area. But anyway, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for much your attention. My name is Michael Carducci. Thank you. Thank you.